דוקטור לליקו, לליה, אני חושב שזה בטח קצת ידענו, אה? סו, צו אבוס הקרדיולוגיסט כאן, קרדיו כאן, נאבוג'ה, and uh, we are very happy to share from our knowledge, share from our experience, and uh, different things we have learned over the years, which are very useful um, here in Nigeria for our care. We will talk about chest pain today very briefly, and uh, if you have any questions, click on the Q&A box um, and write your questions there, and we'll, be, we'll get right to it um, as soon as we are done. Okay, so um, chest pain and acute coronary syndrome. Um, and we started recording. All the recordings are available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can go there, watch not just this topic, you can watch all the Abuja Academy Class Symposium lectures, um, BLS, ACLS, all kinds of things. And really enrich your practice and your patients. Uh, we are happy to have you today. Tell us what you to say. I want to say Happy New Year to yes. everybody. This is the first webinar in the year. I think the last time we did it was, yes. uh, was November. So we welcome everybody and uh, we are glad that you can take out of your, your busy schedule, schedule to, to listen to us today. And I hope uh, we'll be able to provide uh, value for the time you're giving us. Okay, so um, we'll, go, we'll get right to it. Um, so this lecture is brought to you from the Linear Hospital System. Uh, Cardio Care is in Area 11, the Arkea Abuja. The other hospitals are Linear Hospital, Special Care Hospital, which is the Innovator brand, and Linear Children's Hospital, who say to. Our vision is to empower Africa, Nigeria, and empower people through a healthcare system for training, research, and service delivery. That's why we are here. Um, these are our three hospitals, and we are reaching you from the hospital in the center, Cardio Care. It's a flagship special hospital. Um, this is what cardio care we involve in clinical, interventional cardiology, um, ne neurology, stroke medicine, ICU care, and all the different things. We put pacemakers, we take care of heart attacks, we do stents, we do surgeries. Anything that is complex and requires um, intense world class care is cardio care. So today our webinar goals are for one, for you to understand the condition. Two, for you to detect the condition correctly and promptly. Three, to treat the disease and the causes. Four, to prevent complications. So I will want you to understand it in a practical way. So not just the stuff that is taught everywhere, but make sure that you can actually apply it uh, to your use the knowledge. Exactly, and use the knowledge in your, in your day to day uh, clinical practice. Um, so, Let's take this first case. Dr. I'll, I'll read the case and then you, 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 you go through it. 24 year old man, Mr. AJ, insidious chest pain, left sided, non radiating, waxing, and waning. It is aggravated by body condition, positions, and coughing. There are no significant living factors. Maybe, maybe for a certain moment, we leave it. Lasted for several for hours after onset, is moderate in severity. Uh, similar pain about two months ago after an upper respiratory tract infection. No hypertension, diabetes, or high cholesterol. He drinks socially and he occasionally takes weed. His blood pressure was a little bit mildly elevated. Pulse was 106. Other things were essentially uh, normal. So, first question What type of chest pain is this? Is this typical? Is this atypical? Is this non cardiac? Or you don't know. Can we just type in the chat box? I think everybody has access to the chat box. Can we just type in the chat box what we think? What we think is. the answer is. Can we just type in the chat box? So he has a left side sided chest pain and positioning, it is worse when he's taking a deep. They had a similar history of chest pain in the past following upper respiratory tract infection. So what do we think the, this type of pain is? Is it a typical cardiac chest pain? Is it a non-cardiac chest pain? Is it an atypical? Okay. I, I think we're having problems uh, getting to... Okay, beautiful. 
I think I've, I've, I've found it. Sorry, everybody. Uh, now you can uh, comment in the chat box. Sorry, I, I just realized that you could not comment in the chat box. Uh, okay, so good. You. We started getting the responses. Three, two, non-cardiac, uh, non-cardiac, two, typical, atypical, Chino. So Dr. Donald said the atypical. Um, yes, I like this. This is a, mm -hmm. a typical mm -hmm. Nigerian. <laughs> Only that will go to INEC and the Supreme Court to sort it out. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, highlight that non cardiac chest pain does not mean not from the heart. It just yes. means that it's less it's likely. Less likely to be from so cardiac Dr. origin. Doctor Eric, can you perhaps just go through this? What is typical and atypical and non cardiac? So, thank you. We know everybody is scared when it comes to chest pain. Yeah. So, from the objective we set at the beginning, that we want to be able to make an accurate diagnosis yeah. promptly and yeah. to be able to treat and prevent complications. So the first step in anybody presenting with chest pain, you want to know the type of chest pain Correct. the person is having. And there are things that you will see that will make you to think that this is a typical cardiac chest pain yeah. or a less likely cardiac chest pain or it is not a cardiac chest, a cardiac pain at all. So what are these criteria? Number one, we want to talk about location. Yeah. A typical cardiac chest pain is substandard or uterostandard yeah. or behind the okay. sternum, behind the chest. Most people will talk about left sided chest pain, not most of the time, but you see somebody pointing to the middle of the chest behind the sternum. Yeah. And Usually, but we we'll know as we go on, usually precipitated by stress, efforts, exertion, and gets better with rest or with use of nitroglycerin. Exactly. I said as we, as we proceed, we'll, we'll see some little, little, but majorly these three factors. When you have all these three present, you can say this patient has a typical chest, chest pain. pain. If you have less than all three, less likely a cardiac chest pain, it an atypical chest pain, or they call it a less likely cardiac. Yeah. But if none of this is there, or, or, you know, or just one. one, you know this patient has a non-cardiac -cardiac chest pain. But where I want us to be a, a bit careful is you can have someone with peptic ulcer disease. With typical chest pain. With typical chest pain. So it could coexist. Or, or, or you can have somebody with a heart attack presenting with a non-cardiac cardiac. chest pain. That non-cardiac is just the name. It does not mean it's not from the heart. Yes. I, I, I am warning again. The name non-cardiac chest pain just means that it's just the way we type it. It doesn't mean it's not from the heart. So it may be from the it may still be a heart attack it may still be a heart attack. So everybody with chest pain still must have an ECG um, done. So if you look at uh, this patient again, it is aggravated by body conditions. It is insidious. It lasts for hours. There is, so number one, location. Where is the location? Left-sided, okay? So one over three. Number two, what are the aggravating factors? It's not aggravated by exertion, mm -hmm. nor is it used by rest. So what we just have here is just one, is factor. Just one factor. So based on this, we will say the answer is non-cardiac chest pain. And remember, non-cardiac does not mean that it's not, it cannot be anything. It could still be a heart attack. It just means that it is less, less likely. likely. So look at the location, the aggravating factors, relieving factors, and also we look at associations. Are there any uh, things. Somebody says it's coughed with an exertion. Well, coughed with an exertion, but when we say somebody coughed and had chest pain, well, we're talking about exertion like climbing up the staircase, activity, like activity, sexual activity, like running, like golf. That's what we mean by exertion. Um, except you cough for a long time, so you just go, <coughs> and you have chest pain. Uh, yeah. That is more like pleurisy or something like that. Oh, I mean, infection or something. So, 
And then we also look at any other things that can be associated. Yes. Excessive sweating, dizziness, dizziness difficulty with breathing. Exactly. Then, if you have all that cardiovascular risk factor, exactly. then that should also raise your suspicion that you may be dealing with a cardiac chest pain. So maybe the patient has a history of hypertension, yeah. diabetes, hyperlipidemia, he had family history yeah. of a cardiac attack and is having a chest pain, no matter how non cardiac it looks. Please. Even, so, even if the chest pain is on the right, still <laughs> do everything. Do the CG before you say this patient does not have a cardiac chest pain. Okay, so um, we'll go on. There are some characteristics that are less likely to be cardiac. It doesn't mean that it's not cardiac, it's just less likely. When it's very sharp and pinpoint, it's less likely. So there's a study that back to this of a 25 name. When it is just directly under the breast, the breast yes. it's less likely. When it lasts just a few seconds, see, doctor, you just come, feel him. Doctor, in fact, the place is just one pinpoint here. Or when you touch that place and that place is tender, you press that, it feels pain. Or if it is needed to posture or when they eat, and especially in patients that don't have any cardiovascular that is, they don't have diabetes, they don't have hypertension, they don't have history of any cardiovascular disease, either in them or in their family, they can This chest pain is less likely uh, to be. Can you talk about these pretest risk factors? So we, 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 we start talking about this, uh, this risk factor, I mean. So if we go the simple, we say, modifiable, non-modifiable, yes. yes. but just to talk about it generally, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, problem with lipid, presence of peripheral arterial disease, people with family history of heart attack or heart disease, especially premature, premature that is occurring before the age of 40. When you have any or multiple of this in the patient, you know the person has a very high risk uh, probability well, of developing a cardiac pain. So if you add this in somebody and you found one of the criteria, yeah, yeah now you would not say this patient should go, this is not cardiac. In the presence of all these risk factors, you have to fully investigate that person not even only stopping at one ECG, because if you do an ECG and that ECG is normal, does not rule out the fact that the patient does not have an heart attack. You may need to repeat that ECG. Yeah. You may even still have to ask the patient to go for a stress ECG yeah. as the case may be. So once you have all these risk factors, then you have to fully investigate your patient before you allow the patient. So the concept of a pretest is that before you test the person in the algorithm, what is the likelihood? And this is um, backed up by a probability theory formulated by Bayes. It's called the Bayes theory. So before we now say, ah, is it likely or less likely? We now divide the patient. This is high probability, low probability, or intermediate uh, probability for uh, a, a, a cardiac disease. So we say it has a high pretest probability if there are two or more risk factors, especially, but if patient has diabetes, it's already high. Yes. If patient has previous stroke or heart yeah, attack, it's already high. They have preferred to like they're having uh, leg pains when they walk, it's already high. Um, just for those that are joined up, we have over 190, close to 200 people join on this um, webinar. webinar. Um, this is from Cardio Care Hospital here in Abuja. We are teaching on chest pain, and um, uh, acute coronary, coronary syndrome. And uh, we're just taking it step by step. We've just talked about trying to classify chest pain and try to do pretest probability. So once people have a high pretest probability, then the likelihood of a, a cardiac chest pain is very high. One is low. We also are not very, very pushy. But in our environment, we see people with no risk factor and they still have a, a, an MI or, or that. So this is the algorithm formulated by Cardio Care, which for those that were at um, ACS, you have this in the book that has been given to you. I think we should publish it, Dr. Eretham. That's a very 
we should publish it and make some money. What do you think? <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm just joking. Um, to wake up those that are sleeping. All right, so if you look at this first and foremost, at the very top, patient has chest pain. So the patient has chest pain. If you are very unsure, you're at home, you're not in a, in a center, please consider referral to a specialist center like cardio care. Uh, and within 10 minutes of reaching the hospital, an ECG must be done. Like we said to everybody at ACS, make sure that you have ECG available within 10 minutes in all your hospitals. It may be your own life that's going to be saved. So within 10 minutes just of ongoing chest pain, it should be done. Then you evaluate the patient at the same time and do a cardiovascular risk profile. That includes history, do an examination, check previous tests patient may have done, and check blood pressure on good arms. This is important for nurses and for doctors and for other Please, don't just check blood pressure on one hand if somebody has a chest pain. We check on both arms. Whenever we have a significant difference between both arms, typically greater than 20 systolic or, or 10 diastolic, we will suspect that that chest pain might be due to an out problem. That is the central blood vessel coming from the heart it's here, and it's causing chest pain that look like a heart attack. So that we don't, because if you give the same treatment for a heart attack for that one, the patient will die in front of you. So check the blood pressure on both arms in patients coming with a chest pain. Now, the pretend probability which we just talked about, we will come and then do it in this case now and say, are they high, intermediate, or low risk? For those with low risk, we do and everybody must have an ECG. Remember, if the ECG is normal, then, I mean, you it's just, likely. it's less likely, and then you might exclude other cardiac causes. Sometimes, if you are still unsure, add troponin. Troponin is a cardiac enzyme, and you can get it done in most centers, most specialty centers, or you can send the blood to cardiac care immediately. You get your results typically within 15 to 20 minutes, so I can take action immediately. Now, if there's ongoing chest pain or the person having chest pain in the last 10 days, you want to contend to 14 days, you want to do troponin. Troponin will still be elevated up to 14 days after an acute MI. If troponin is negative and ECG was normal then, and the patient who has low risk, no further things for that. Yes. Okay, however, if patient ET is abnormal, you're not here, not yet, please do troponin, and then you can now proceed further. If, if troponin is positive, admit straight, get to a special hospital and let us manage like cardio care. Now, if you have one risk factor hypertension, they have one thing or the other, then you will not begin to consider. First, whether normal or abnormal, please, if they have a risk factor, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, do troponin if you can. If money is not a problem and, to, and if labs are not a problem, please do a troponin immediately. Um, then, um, you now, if you have an abnormal ECG, however, you are also going to do troponin in both of them, and you can go straight to monitor to managing in the ICU setting and you know activating full care. If the person has one or more risk factors and the ECG is normal, please do not send the patient home. Please, severe chest pain, they have one uh, abnormal ECG, and the ECG is ongoing. Do not send that patient home. Repeat that ECG in three to six hours. By the time there is a change in that ECG, consider it as abnormal. If there is a change, ECG is changing, consider it as abnormal. So those are the things. If you send that patient home, that patient may, may not return back to this world. Okay, fine. Now, if it's a high risk ECG, if it's abnormal, I mean, it's just the same thing that it can be it. However, in high risk, you have a higher index of, of uh, suspicion. Now, if you have negative troponin with a normal ECG in high intermediate risk and the person is having typical or not typical chest pain, you may want to do a stress test. That is, put do an ECG on a treadmill using standard protocol. If you don't have a stress ECG match and you need to refer to a place that they can do it, you can refer to cardio care, we'll do it. Typically, you must take certain precautions when you are doing the stress ECG. If this stress ECG is positive, go straight to the cath lab, like we have in cardio care, and then we'll do the coronary angio and then fix any problem. If the ECG is normal, then look for other causes. I mean, the stress ECG is normal for other causes. Now, if you have chest pain, 
you have a normal ECG that remains normal after six hours. Troponin is negative, but the patient has a high probability of coronary artery disease, diabetes, peripheral artery disease, previous cardiovascular disease. Please still consider for a coronary artery. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until they have a full fledged heart attack. There's likely something there that may be causing it. Okay, so, and then we'll talk about the management once we get there. I hope this is very clear. I don't know if anybody has any questions on this algorithm. So first, everybody with chest pain, do an ECG. Then, for those with no risk, you may proceed without a, a troponin if it's normal ECG, but sometimes you should consider doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, if the ECG is normal or abnormal and there's one or more risk, you must do troponin, and then troponin is positive to an abnormal ECG, then you will proceed further. But I don't have to add. Yeah. I think essentially it's about the ECG that we should not be confused that, oh, the ECG is normal. Because like we we'll see as we go forward that you can have MI, heart attack, without a change on the ECG. Yeah. Without a change on the ECG. Especially, I know we, most of us will be looking for ST segment yeah. elevation. You can have it without an ST segment elevation so and that is why you need to do your troponin make sure you are found whether the patient has IRS. so IRS patients normal ecg does not rule out exactly a, an heart attack I, I remember to repeat it if patient is having active ongoing pain remember to repeat your no ecg good and get special input if you are our um Abuja Medical Symposia WhatsApp group, and we'll give you an opportunity to join the WhatsApp group uh, during the course of this uh, presentation. You can send your ECG there so that we can all look at it and assist you. And you can reach out to us in Cardio Care. We can assist you and give you guidance where necessary. All right. Um, so now this ECG, can you go to me so that they can know what is... Uh, so we're, we're talking about change. Changes on ECG. So, what are the changes we're looking at? The changes we're looking at is we're looking at the ST segment, which is the line joining the T and the S wave. Though the S wave is not showing and the QRS complex. In, yeah, so, but here we can say the QRS complex. The S wave, like we're teaching, ECG is your second negative deflection or the negative deflection after the first major positive deflection on wow. ECG. So there is a, this line joining that S wave or the QRS complex and this T wave, which is called the ST segment. So the ST segment is supposed to be on this straight line. So if you draw a straight line from this T wave to the P wave, the ST segment should be on that line. Yeah. So, when we are saying the ST segment is elevated, that means this line is above this straight line. So, if you follow my cursor and you look at this, so this is the line that I talked about. So, we can see that this, this ST segment that joined this T wave and this QRS complex is above this line. So, we we'll say that if you are looking at this line, if there's elevation yeah. greater than and two millimeter in what we call contiguous leads. Yeah. I believe those people that have been joining us for ECS will understand and for some some of our past webinar where we talk about ECG, we understand what we mean by contiguous lead. We are saying the leads that are looking at the app from the same direction. So we talk about lead two, three AVF looking yeah. at the art from below, inferior leads. Yeah. Then we talk of Lead V5, V6, one, and AVL that is they are looking at the art from the lateral aspect. Yeah. Then we talk about V1, V2, V3, V4, looking at the art anteriorly and around the center. So we call it anterior center. So when you are looking, so at least two, where you have three, must be saying the same thing before you say there is a significant ST segment elevation. Or sometimes you can have it depressed below that line. So you can also have ST segment depression. So I think that's just the summary of what we're looking at. And also the shape of the elevation. 
because both are important when we are talking about chest pain. For myocardial infarction, for heart attack, the ST segment is what we call convex or what we call convi uh, concave down. So the person is frowning. While for other cause of chest pain, what you have is a concave ST segment elevation that is concave up. That is the person is smiling. So when somebody is frowning, you see the way the lip is going to be. That is what we see in patients that has heart attack. But in patients that have like uh, pericarditis yeah. due to inflammation of the covering of the heart, you can have this other pattern where you have this concavity. But other things that will help you here is for pericarditis, you will have it diffuse. It is not a contiguous lead as you have in patients with heart attack. Let, let me just add that. We I, I thank you all for joining us. We have over 250, 240 people joining us today, healthcare professionals from across the country. Uh, this is cardio care, and we are teaching about how to manage chest pain. We first started by explaining the type of chest pain, and we said the chest pain could be typical, atypical, or non-cardiac, depending on the location and whether I, how it responds with exactly the duration. We now see that every single patient that presents with chest pain, including ulcer, should have an ECG. No exceptions. Every single patient. We now see that the ECG could show you a, a, I mean, a, a problem with the, with the ECG or not. Now, we say this is a normal ECG. We typically look at the ST and the T wave. And it's normal because on the line, it is, the line is straight. So this line and this line are on the same level. That is why we say that it is a normal no, no. ECG. When this line has this uh, QRS complex that looks like the other, up, down, up. When this line goes up oh. like this, we say that is an ST elevation. elevation MI. When it goes down or there's a T wave upside down, T wave is upside down like this, we say there is a T wave inversion, okay? In that case, if you find any of these three abnormalities, that ECG is abnormal. So when we talked about our algorithm for chest pain, and we're saying normal or abnormal, whenever you find any changes in the ST segment or the T wave that is, up, that is upside down, that ECG is abnormal. Now, it is further strengthened when there is more than one lead that is showing it, and preferably the leads that are grouped together like this. You need to cram these leads. Preferably the leads that are grouped together like this. Um, so if you look at that, you can now see what we're talking about. So we say normal, abnormal. So this abnormal, all abnormal ECGs must have a proponent. proponent. Now you are reaching us, we have over 260 people, yes, 250 people now. You are reaching us from far and wide. You are saying, ah, in, in this part of the country, we don't have ECG. What do we do? Nothing. Go and get ECG. <laughs> oh, in this part of the country, we don't have troponin. What do we do? Nothing. Go troponin. Nigeria is not broke. Go and get it. It is critical. It is critical to be able to differentiate the heart attack from a not a heart attack chest pain. We have blamed witches and wizards, and that the person will trust time for the person to finally make it. Then he was about to become a director, then somebody killed him. Nobody killed him. He had a chest pain and an MI that killed him. And that's what we are trying to teach. As soon as you do the ECG, check this line of the ECG. Check the ST segment that we pointed here and the T wave. If this is up or below this line, then you see that's an abnormal ECG. And preferably, if it now further comes together in similar leads that are looking at the same part of the heart, we say, ah, this person is likely having a heart attack. If you don't have cardiac enzymes like troponins, but you have ECG, it may be enough if the ECG is very clear. But when the ECG is not clear, like in n you absolutely need that enzyme to be able to help you. So that is what we just try to discuss here. So um, there are some history that may help you if it's worse on lying down. And when you lean forward, like I'm leaning forward now, it gets better. Is more likely to be due to pericarditis. Now, I must make a caveat here. Pericarditis can happen after an MI. Yes. I could complicate an MI. So it will show that there's a complication. So it does not mean like, ah, this is a pericarditis. Take it to some room. No. 
you must still follow the algorithm that we have set before you. This algorithm, it will take a long time for you to be able to um, master, you know, master it, but it is, has been put together from years of experience here in this country. So if there's a dyspepsia, that is it is worse when they are hungry and it gets better when they eat and it is peppery and it's burning, uh, it's so likely. It's well, we should also still be careful with this. Because yes. if you remember, Christmas Eve last year, as a man that came in yes. that has been managed repeatedly for peptic ulcer disease. Yes. And when he came in on that uh, on the 24th, my birthday, I that's why I didn't forget. <laughs> He has ST segment elevation from V1 to V6. Yeah, yeah. Elevated troponin, and it was the one that we did plot extraction. Yes, I will show you the case. Mm -hmm. I will show you the case before. So we... please, we are the fact that chest pain uh, improves with use of antacid and whatever does not rule out at all. So you can have an ulcer and at the same time have uh, an heart attack. Please, any adult with chest pain, please do an ECG. Please, even if you say ulcer, if you have an adult with ulcer, please do an ECG. It is cheap, it is available, it is non invasive, it doesn't hurt anybody to have an ECG. All of us, 252 now, people on this group, on this um, call now, across the country, go and do your own ECG. Have a baseline ECG that people can use. God forbid there is a problem. Have an ECG, just like you have your passport. Post it on Instagram and keep it there. <laughs> I'm trying to scan it here. I'm joking. Okay, fine. I think this, this session could be discussed. These are just pointers. It does not mean that you will see that and, and, and we can have fluting case pain and have an MI. It does not stop anything. You can have fever and have an MI. So you will still do ECG, but when you're taking history, look out for this thing, which will be a pointer so that you don't miss the um, diagnosis. Um, I'll just keep this. Um, Okay, still that's the same, the same, the same case. case. Okay, fine. So that same case, 24-year-old man, AJ. AJ has come with insidious left sided chest pain. It is non radiating It is waxing and waiting. It's aggravated by different body positions and coughing. There is no significant relieving factor. Uh, it has lasted for hours after onset, moderate. He had a chest pain similarly like two months after a respiratory tract infection. No significant risk factors. He drinks occasionally. And smokes weed. Um, blood pressure was 146, 76, pork was, was elevated, other things were, were normal. So, question one is the history and clinical examination adequate? Yes, no, I don't know. Can we put it in the chat box? Yes, no, I don't know. Yes, no, I don't know. Put in the chat, chat box. No, no. If you say no, tell us what is missing. If you say, yeah, hey, I can see some people say yes. If you say no, tell us what is missing. If you say, I don't know, be bold, right? I don't know. Thank you, um, Onoge, Gabriel Uma, Olashino, Abiola, uh, Hadiza Shetima, um, Judith Agbo, Mildred Alexander, thank you. Yes, I don't know. This is an ECG. I don't know. No, we're just asking about the history. History and uh, history and clinical examination. examination. So, so there are some things that we want to know in this history. One of the things we talked about is previous family history of uh, sudden cardiac death, of cardiac attacks, previous history of cardiovascular disease, strokes, and the like are also important. Okay, so some of those histories are also important in this um, in this case. So we'll go for this is the ECG of the patient. What do we think? Is this normal, abnormal, or uh, I don't know. <laughs> so we have gone to the ECG. Normal, abnormal. I don't know. This is a part of the presentation <laughs> that people don't like to see. But so, by the way, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, Cardio Care, just search your Cardio Care YouTube channel, you will see several presentations where we have taken time to explain ECG as simply as possible. So if you follow them, you will be able to do the message. Okay, and we are coming up with a very nice course that anybody can do at, on their own time and get a certificate for. Okay, so let's go through it up together. I can see different uh, answers there. Uh, normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal. Okay, so people say abnormal, they did not tell us what was abnormal. Okay, so let's look at it together. 
we look at the ST segments. So in all the ST segments, we cannot see any elevation or depression. However, we can see that the T wave is inverted here in one, and then the brother of one is what A, V, L, and V5 and V6. So we can see the T wave inverted in one, is inverted in A, V, L, and it's somewhat inverted in V2 and V3, but V2 and V3 are not brothers. But we can see one and A, V, L. We have over 260 people but joining us. Thank you for joining us today from Cardio Care Abuja. Um, we are leaders in cardiovascular medicine, National Center of Excellence. All right, so we'll proceed. We did this investigation. ESR was 30, white blood cell count was fair, cholesterol was marginally elevated, LDL was not bad, and these were found. Troponin was normal, and stress was yes. negative. So, what is our final diagnosis? White blood cell count 6,400, platelets 220,000. The other things did that here or there, troponin normal, stress is negative. What is our final diagnosis? Final diagnosis. Yes, final diagnosis. Dr. Dr. what do you think? So, from, from this, it's clear that it's not it's not uh, MI. my MI. Pneumonia is less likely. It's less likely because the pulmonary embolism less is less likely. So the most likely answer here is musculoskeletal pain. But like you said, there's still some T wave changes. Yeah. Some left parties deviation. So there still may still be need for further evaluation. But if you look at this, the most likely from this option is likely a musculoskeletal chest pain. Now remember, remember very well that if a patient comes in and has ongoing chest pain and has that kind of ECG, repeat it in three to six hours before, yes. you, before you make any um, final change. Why is it unlikely to be MI? Why is it unlikely to be coronary syndrome or MI? So, after coronary syndrome, and we take help of coping. So, now, Talking about acupuncture syndrome is, is a spectrum of yeah. clinical condition. Yeah. Where patients has recent changes in symptoms, correct? With or without yeah. changes on the ECG. Yeah. And with or without elevation of cardiac troponin. And so that's why we kept repeating that the fact that ECG is normal yeah. does not rule out the fact that patients cannot have acute coronary syndrome, which we said is a spectrum of three conditions. So, and the three conditions are unstable angina, yeah. non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, or ST elevation myocardial infarction, or we can say there is an MI with normal troponin, yes. MI with well, elevated troponin. Well, we well, use MI or, or, or let's ACS yes, with acute coronary syndrome with normal troponin, yeah. acute coronary syndrome with elevated troponin. Let, let, let's, yes. let's put it down. If, if the enzymes are elevated, it could either be SMI or semi elevated enzyme. If the ECG is not showing a classic ST elevation, it could either be unstable or angina right. or SMI. In unstable angina, the enzyme is negative and the ECG is negative. But it's not completely negative. It, is, it has some T wave prevention, it has some ST depressions, uh, you know, sometimes. Now, if the enzymes are positive and the ECG is not a classical one, typically we will now say you have an N stemite. So, N stemite typically, like I put the star here, in the, typically shows other signs of myocardial ischemia with positive. Now, in a third case, the ECG is showing query elevation and the enzymes are negative. You need to now consider one, are you cutting the, the MI too early? Too early yes. So, things are happening too. Is there an old MI that the S elevation has failed to come down? Three, are you dealing with a pericarditis? In which case, there is widespread um, S elevation, elevation and then some. Uh, related enzymes or not. So this is the what kind of tries to help us. So negative ECG, negative enzymes, stable or stable angina. angina. All of these people have chest pain ongoing. Then they have negative ECG, 
But ECG has ischemic changes so, and positive enzymes in stemine. Positive ECG, that is SK elevation, and positive enzymes stemine. All of these are classified like this because of prognosis. Number three has the worst prognosis and, and, and going down like that. This is why you have to really take them up. Anybody with an MI, you has to has to get intensive specialist care immediately. Again, intensive specialist care immediately. Do not joke with an MI. They can be laughing with you one moment and dead the next. So don't think that the patient was stable. I find the patient walking to the hospital. There is nothing like that. Once you make the diagnosis, that patient can be laughing with you one minute and is dead the next. Do not take it lightly. So. One of the very main reasons we are here is that people say, oh, he just had an ulcer now. This ulcer has been there for one week. Please and please, you have attended this webinar, and this webinar will stand against you. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm joking. All right, fine. So can you take us through this universal definition, sir? So the, the universal definition is just emphasizing what we have talked about, that what divine uh, myocardial infarction is you must have evidence of injury to the myocardium correct plus symptoms of myocardial ischemia correct so the pain and all those stuff we talk about are symptoms of myocardial ischemia correct but if you don't have evidence of myocardial injury or necrosis, which is elevated troponin. Exactly. So if you have evidence of myocardial ischemia, which is mainly chest pain, or uh, maybe you did your echo, you saw some changes, uh, as in mainly symptoms, you will say the patient has unstable angina. Exactly. But once you have evidence of myocardial necrosis or injury, which could either be uh, troponin, yeah. You did your echo, you, you saw um hypokinesia or whatever, or any yeah. other evidence of uh, reduced mobility or abnormal mobility, or you did uh, if you have CT angle or those stuff. Once you have evidence of injury to the mouse site and with ischemia, the patient has a myocardial infarction. Now you now look at your ECG. Oh, Is yeah. there an elevation of the ST segment that it becomes stemmine? Exactly. No ST segment elevation, non stem stem. So that is what this one is telling us. All right, I'm sure I'm sure we are getting from this. Chest pain nugget number one. Everyone, every single person, whether it's your priest, whether it is your a man, your friend, your father, anybody, probably with acute chest pain must have an ECG within five to ten minutes of entering the emergency room. Everyone, and that should be interpreted. Everyone, this is a standard. This is a standard. So I know we are not doing so many standards and litigation in Nigeria, but this is a standard. Everybody must have this interpreted so that we can. So let's take this second paper to our talk. So we have a 56 year old male here with worsening sharp, with emphasis on the word sharp, sharp chest pain in the last two days. Aggravated by coughing and when he's lying supine, and it gets better when he sits up. It, it reduces to the left arm and back. There's associated fever, tachypnea, nausea. Is a non hypertensive Previous history of stroke with residual weakness, and uh, he has tachycardia, the deep blood pressure 146, 76, uh, tachypnea, and the oxygen saturation. Uh, was 88 percent in uh, rushed into our emergency and the chest exam is normal no smoking no issue of alcohol consumption beautiful beautiful so again can we answer in our chat box typical chest pain atypical chest pain non-cardiac chest pain i don't know can we please answer we have close 260 plus people that have joined this uh, webinar today. Is this typical? Is this atypical? Is this non cardiac? Remember, we say that typical chest pain has, or well, should I keep saying it? Or should I just, uh, let them try, let them try. So, somebody say typical, atypical, and then we say atypical has what's whatever. Good. Ebuka, a cause of. 
Gabriel Umar, thank you for trying. Christy Wonu, thank you for trying. Okay, Chukun Goka, thank you for trying. Yes, a typical non cardiac chin also. Uh, thank you all. Abdullah Zak, Abdusalam. Uh, I see you. Ask Lev Abdusi. Okay, good. Everybody is saying typical, atypical. Typical, atypical. This has to go to Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. So let's let's go to Supreme Court and see. We we define the um, typical and atypical by number one. We said if there's chest pain retro, in the typical retrosternal or left sided, that's one over three. Two over three it is aggravated by exertion or emotional or stress. Emotional stress. stress. And three it is relieved by and rest. Yes. This is not relieved by rest, it's relieved by sitting up. This is also not written by exertion. The person does come and have it, and it's written by light flat. So, and, and we also talked about some other features that reduce chest pain, less likely cardiac. Correct. And one of the things we talked about is the pain being sharp, very sharp, and of very long duration. In fact, a lot of patients with chest heaviness, not pain. And yes. so we must be very, so very conscious. Discomforts, ah. uh, evidence, load on my, on my chest. chest. So by the time somebody is describing a very sharp pain, it is less likely. But we have warned us yeah, that will. we should not just be swayed by all this description. Go and get evidence mm -hmm. for the Supreme Court. So now we have came here, and then so this is an atypical cardiac chest yes. pain. Okay, it's atypical, more or less. All right. Um, so ESR came out as ninety. Troponin is normal, also normal from the referral center. Full blood count has a, a slightly upper limit of I mean mm -hmm. of uh, this total white cell count. EU was otherwise. Fasting blood sugar was impaired. HbA1c2 was slightly impaired. Urinalysis was normal. This was ECG. Is this a normal or an abnormal ECG? Yes, remember our algorithm? Normal or abnormal? Can we please put it in the chat box? Normal or abnormal? Somebody said, with the slide be shared? Yes, the slides will be shared immediately after this, after this, together with CME points. If you join for two minutes and left, you will not get the CME points, so don't be angry. But if you have to join for a significant period of time to get the CME points so that you do the right thing, good. So use the chat box and answer. Use the chat box and answer. Abnormal, 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 normal, ECG abnormal. So fine, let's look at it together. You see the line, see the line here, and see this ST, ST segment. Is it elevated or not? It is elevated. Let me see. So can we see that this line now, it is elevated. We can see that it's elevated um, in, in that area. It is also elevated here in V2. It is V3 is elevated. V4 is elevated. See the lower line and see the upper line. It's elevated there. Uh, V5, V6 is elevated. Okay. Even this AVF is slightly elevated. Okay. V2 is elevated. Every, almost everywhere is elevated. So that is a major uh, problem that we have seen. It is elevated in multiple places. So you can see the elevation here, 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 here. Ah. And then we say the troponin was normal. normal. So what would be the diagnosis in this case? What would be the diagnosis in this case? What will be the diagnosis in this case? We talk about that ST elevation, white always everywhere, and normal. So is normal. The chest pain is relieved when the patient tried to sit up. Correct. There was fever. The WBT upper border of normal. So in this condition, what will be our most likely final diagnosis? So somebody said active MI uh, while. Other person I think MI, most people are saying pericarditis, nice. pericarditis, pericarditis. Good, it's working. It's working. It's, uh, so it's working. I think we're, we're, we're in the right direction. So this is likely. So let's look at it again so that we can just remember. We can see the, the elevation, what elevation and depression is from here. 
And then we said positive ECG sub elevation widespread with negative enzymes. You should consider pericarditis. Once the enzyme is negative, it's more likely. And then this chest pain has that typical lying down, washing, and sitting up in the tibia. And then the S elevation is widespread. So active pericarditis. I'm so happy. Woo! Great, 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 great. Uh, we're making progress. Okay, so based on the result, hypertension was case was made with cat lab step down, admitted for bed rest, had antibiotics and anti-inflammatory agents. By day four, less breathless, you did not need oxygen again, ESR reduced, white blood cell count also reduced. And this is the repeat ECG after treatment. Now you can see everything has come down. By the way, there are four ECG stages on on for acute pericarditis. Yes. So in this case, what are the clues? The chest of the prostate, it was pleuritic. It was positional. There was widespread um, elevation and peer depression, and there was minimal or normal, um, um, I mean, minimal cardiac or, um, enzyme. So remember, pericarditis could be a late completion of stemite. So yes. keep your eyes open. This could just complicate an MI that person have had before. So keep your eyes open. These are the four stages. First, white of ST elevation. So when this man came in with breathlessness, with SPO2 low, he was in stage one. Widespread and reciprocal changes. Okay, next, we, we start normalizing. The T wave starts flattening within one to three weeks. Next, the flattening T waves become inverted. And then stage four, the ECG returns back to normal. So this is the typical ECG stage. It doesn't always follow like this. Uh, less than 50% of patient progress classically produced for. Some could jump from one to four and, and so on and so forth. So it's just for you to know um, this. Okay. So um, somebody asked before that how do we differentiate benign repolarization? I can see that in the QA. Sandra Ogwa Nochi Chiaquen, sorry. Uh, so ask that, how do you differentiate stem by and any polarization phenomenon? I get a bit confused. So let's unconfuse you. Number one way to help is to look at the ST to T wave ratio. ST to T wave ratio. Okay, so we look at the um, ST segment elevation versus the height of the T wave. So let's assume this ST segment elevation versus this height. So this ST segment elevation, for example, is, is call it about three small boxes. And then the height of the T wave, call it about 10 small boxes. So uh, call it, yeah, 10, 11 small boxes. So if it is greater than 0 0.25, you are thinking of uh, pericarditis. While it is less than 0 0.25, you are thinking of benign early repolarization. OK? Um, in benign early repolarization, it's more common also in V2 and V3. And it's not typically in contiguous mm -hmm. Then um, the fish hook pattern, typically in V4, you can see how it is here. Fish hook just after you just have a small hook there. Um, typically, will move towards any repolarization, and then the ECG remains stable. In when you try, unlike this one, the ECG is going off after a while, it comes down, normalizing to reverse. This one remains stable over time. And, and the age where this is found, so this is common in young, young early middle age. People, you really find that picture in elderly patients. Then, like we said, when you look at your ECG, you couple it with your yeah. clinical presentation for yeah. you to be able to determine what you are dealing with. Okay, so if you have questions, put them in the chat box. We're talking about chest pain. Uh, we are going on. Must ECG be done for all patients presenting with abdominal pain who also has precursor factors? Victor Ajibo asks, the answer is yes. yes. Yes, ECG should be done for all patients, even if they present abdominal pain, especially if they have a diabetic comes to abdominal pain, do an ECG. Please, uh, uh, do an ECG so I don't miss an embarrass. Because the cost of cost of missing is too high. It's yes. typically dead. Yes, 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 yes. So you cannot uh, afford that. Okay. And we should not forget in women, people with, diabe uh, with diabetes, what they have is what we call angina equivalent. Exactly. They may not present with chest pain. It might just be dizziness. Yeah. It might just be undue tiredness. Yeah. So please, 
the cost of ECG, like we said, is far, far cheaper. And if you have ever lost any patients to this because you are thinking it was peptic ulcer, you will not mind doing ECG. I used to tell my patient that if you come in every day complaining <laughs> of chest pain, you will do ECG every day. Because the fact that the ECG was normal yesterday does not mean that it will be normal today. So please, let's have that at the back of our mind. Okay, well, we have over 260 people to 270 people that have joined us from around the country. This is Cardio Chem or Therapy Hospital in Abuja, uh, where the National Center of Excellence for Cardiovascular Medicine, private. Uh, we hope to reverse medical tourism. Uh, we do that with our cath lab, with our cardiologists, our specialists treating all manners of cardiovascular disease, but also we want to educate and, be, and grow the Nigerian medical populace to improve healthcare. And so today we brought chest pain to you and we are going for it. You are just joining us. At the end of this uh, lecture, you will get in your emails, the email you to register, you will get your CME and you will get a copy of the slides. You will get that within three to five days after this lecture. You can also rewatch the lecture on our YouTube channel and other lectures that are there. This is for those that are just joining us. Chest pain number two. Cardiac enzymes are invaluable. A negative troponin in an appropriate patient should be repeated. So troponins typically start rising from 6 to 12 hours. So the patient is having chest pain right now, that started one hour ago. The ECG may be showing elevation, but the troponin is negative. Does not mean you repeat the troponin in the 6 to 12 hours, you will see that it's still rising. So you should also be considerate that sometimes it, it's, um, it can lag behind. And we have gone through this uh, algorithm before. We want to do all patients ECG, then abnormal or normal ECG, do troponins. And then if you have intermediate pretests, um, you should consider doing a stress ECG, which can be in cardio care. If you are not sure, please refer to a specialist or call us in cardio care. You can refer them to us. Case three. I remember this case. The daughter of somebody in our choir. 16 year old female, central, I think one here. Central chest skin, central chest discomfort, artificial referral, easy fatigability, very minor chest discomfort over the last two weeks. Anytime she walks for some distance, it's aggravated and it's relieved by rest. No radiation, associated lethargy and malaise. Because she's a young girl, 16 years old, no hypertension, no PM, no smoking, alcohol, no illicit drugs. She's tachycardic, uh, pulse which is 110, blood pressure is normal. Very mild ankle swelling. I think it's almost having um, heart failure. And oxygen saturation is normal. Chest exam is normal. Fine. This is looking difficult. This is looking difficult. This is why we are here. Okay. So let, let's go. Troponin came out. CD troponin, 9.7. That is over, maybe over 20 times, over 30 times the upper limit of normal. Why blood cell count slightly on the upper side? All other things are within normal. Passing blood sugar slightly. Um, ESR 80, very high. HbOC and blood sugar is relatively okay. So, this was the ECG. Is this ECG normal or abnormal? <laughs> oh, let's go this way. Is this a myocardial infarction? Yes. No. I don't know. Is this a myocardial infarction? Use the chat box. Don't use the Q&A. Use Q&A to ask questions. Is this a myocardial infarction? Yes. No. I don't know. Again, let me show you the ECG. In case you missed the ECG, maybe you blinked. This is the ECG. Uh, yes. No. I don't know. It, this was the ECG. And uh, we said the troponin was over 30 times the upper limit. ESR was also severely elevated. This person is a 16-year-old. Is this... And with no risk factors, no pretests, low pretest probability. Yes, try, try, try. Try. But that to be wrong here and to be wrong on the patient. All right, great. So a lot of people, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Somebody said no, and get out of the risk. Okay, let me just say this is the show you now. Let me just say, and get out of the risk is not a diagnosis. And Angina pectoris is not a diagnosis. Let me say it again. Let me say Angina pectoris is not like that. But Angina pectoris is not a diagnosis. It is like saying chest pain. 
Yes. And Jaira is another name for chest pain. Pectoris is chest, and Jaira is pain. More or less. When we say a female has a Jaira, is pain. So we have this. So let's look at the ECG. Is it abnormal? In most cases, it is almost normal. Hardly any ST's elevation or depression. No. But there's still wave inversion no, there from V3, V4, V5, V6. So slightly abnormal, but no significant ST or T wave changes. Okay. So it is it is possible that it's an SMI because yes. the ST there's an abnormality on this. So could it be a malfather infarction? Yes. yes. It could be the one without ST segment elevation. elevation. Correct. So now you before you now proceed, you need to now go and check. Okay, remember this thing by the ESC. We have elevated cardiac enzymes. You need to ask yourself, is there acute ischemia or not? No acute ischemia. So we now look at this case. Is there acute ongoing chest pain? The answer is no. no. He had just mild, more or less, was breathlessness when she walks. So there is no acute ischemia. And in that case, you are dealing with either myocarditis or a heart failure. So you have elevated troponin and you have myocarditis or a heart failure. Yeah. Now, if you check over time and the troponin remains stable, it's not going up and down then you will think of a chronic myocardial injury, okay? Um, so in this case, no significant chest pain over the last two weeks and you're going to school, just get a little bit breathless, some leg swelling here and there, and ESR is elevated. So we think it's more of a myocarditis that gave us that, that chest pain. And remember okay. the lady went as far as uh, America. UK. Yes, she went to the US. And came back with uh, what we give from him. The same diagnosis was my cadence after they spent some very thousands of dollars. So that's what I mean. Yes, like, you to and it's yeah. also to show us that troponin elevation is not only caused by yes. That is why the, that is why the definition was very key. There must be evidence of all of acute ischemia, like chest pain. So in this case, there was no chest pain, just the troponin was elevated, that's all. And then we had all those other symptoms. So that is what it looked like. So let's take this case. 65-year-old man, pressure like chest pain, 12 hours ago and two hours, aggravated by walking, relieved by omeprazole and relieved yes. by rest. Associated dizziness, palpitations, and weakness. Not have hypertension, but blood pressure was elevated at the source of referral. He was given amlodipine and terbizotan. He had to even have two drugs for when he was referred. And he was given omeprazole, doesn't smoke or drink. He was referred to cardio care from another hospital as an emergency. Pulse and blood pressure was this. Um, respiratory was thirty, so he was tachypneic. And the SPO2 was low. So what do we think? What kind of chest pain is this? So let's put in the chat box. What kind of chest pain is this? So let's consider the location is brought on by exaction, released with rest, and omeprazole. Not previously hypertensive, but have to be given two blood pressure medication to make the to bring the BP down. Yeah. Look at the age. Yeah. SPO2, all of that. All right, atypical, typical, 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 but more typical. So this is more typical, right? Number one, it is retrosternal. That is first, so one over three. Number two, so calibrated by exertion, walking, two over three. Number three, it is relieved by rest, three over three. So typical chest pain. Typical chest pain. And we also talked about, the Kalika talked about related risk factors. BP was elevated, related. Related problems. He had distance, he had palpitation, he had weakness, SPO2 oh, slow. So typical chest pain. You should be very careful with this case. Now, guess what? See the troponin, over 40 times the upper limit. H. pylori is also positive. That is why don't just go and start the H. pylori. It does not solve any problem. In fact, after you treat it, it will still remain positive for a very long time. So, cholesterol is elevated, um, ESR was, HBO was, was mild elevated, and that's what we found. But troponin is elevated. So, what was the next thing? Look at the ECG. So, let's see the ECG. Now look at the ECG. Is this ECG normal or abnormal? So that we don't waste time. Or what's the final diagnosis? What's the final diagnosis for this case? 
Let's just write on your final diagnosis for this case. Let me go back to the ECG so that you can see. All the final diagnosis for this case. Wow, people are getting it. Acute MI, that is it. It's not just MI, it is MI. There's ST elevation, it's not non ST. We can see V2, V3, V4, all shade elevation. Although the ST elevation is on the, on the downward trend, it's already coming back down. But this is classical concave upwards elevation, anti wave invasion. Um, oh, somebody says anti-receptor, that's a good person. Warren Clements, well, uh, sorry if, if I, I don't know that it's professor or, or so please apologize, I apologize. Samuel Eja says, and um, Akis Terman. So, great, thank you so much. So, we think, yes, um, it's, it's an MI in this regard. We have ongoing signs of uh, elevated troponin, we have acute ischemia, acute uh, MI, and then we know we have uh, taken it. So, how is MI recognized? We have four profiles. One, chest pain, most common. Two, complications. People may just come with complications, heart failure. Three, they may come and they may have no other symptom, just a yes. silent MI. And four, sudden cardiac, they just cardiac arrest. But remember, not everyone with heart attack has yes. chest pain. Please, they could have abdominal pain. We've had, we have done the angles of people uh, with abdominal pain, no single chest pain, and it was an MI, and we had to put a stent, emergency. Luckily, the person had that referred the person had watched, had been for one of the presentations, I was able to diagnose. Ah, let's do an ECG, and they just saw it. Bam, they brought the patient immediately to the patient in and stented the patient's artery. So, and those are the four typical profiles. But patients could also have tachycardia, hypertension. We are moving a little bit faster. We follow, we've gone through all of these things. Uh, I will not, I will not move this. So, okay, let's go over this so, acute, acute coronary syndrome. So, they say, they say it's as simple as ACS. Oh. So, we talk about your abnormal ECG, whether okay. it's ST elevation, ST depression, T wave inversion, or you have your Q wave. Then the clinical context, history, yeah. history of chest pain, history of um, hypertension, or the risk factor. Then you want to know is this patient stable? Because we said the patient can come with chest pain yeah. or can come with complication, either heart failure, can come in shock, yeah. can come with arrhythmia, or can even come in coma. Yes. And this will help you to quickly make your decision as per what the next step to do. What am I going to do for this patient? Am, am I supposed to watch this patient Correct. in a place where uh, angio can be done? Or if I can't get there within a good time, can I give a clot blood sack for this patient as soon Correct. as possible? So this will help you to make that initial assessment so that you can quickly, because like we, we talk in the, uh, the new uh, neuro, neurologist and neurosurgeon talk about um, time, uh, brain cell is time. Most, I mean. that's time is most uh, So, yeah, time, time is, is muscle. The longer you wait, the yeah. more cardiac muscle that you lose. Okay, so um, how do we treat my cardiac infarction? So, what will you do? You have made the diagnosis. What will you do um, to treat my cardiac infarction? So, um, first of all, early response is critical. Any response is absolutely vital. Within one hour, you have, you know, little, if you can abort less than one hour, little, little damage. One to two hours, minor damage. Two to four hours is already moderate. By the time you are getting to six to 12 hours, you are beginning to have permanent loss. Greater than 12 hours, sometimes you don't even bother reperfusing, except the patient will take a dynamic kind of stable or there's there's some interest me. So we have, uh, can you go over this for a little So, like we said, that time is more. So what you want to do is to restore blood flow back to that heart muscle as soon as possible. So that is your number one goal. So no matter the means you want to use, you want to restore coronary blood flow, you want to reduce complication, and when it has set in, you want to treat it. You want to reduce mortality and morbidity, prevent recurrence, and you try to rehabilitate this patient because some of them, by the time they come in, We've already suffered significant loss of um, cardiac myocytes and the cardiac function is compromised and you may have need to do some form of rehabilitation. But that number one yeah. is very, very as soon essential. As possible. possible. If you are in a good environment, you can send to cardiac care. We have 
um, a calf lab and we have a team on ground that can get the patient in and open up the block actually immediately. That is the gold standard. If you are far, further away, you need to consider giving a thrombolytic, something that can block, that can open that blood clot, and then you can now transfer for us to now put a stent in to open. And if you cannot do any of this or there is severe financial constraints, you may now consider other things. But you must treat them fairly, so reduce um, complications, treat any complications, reduce mortality, reduce risk of recurrence, and rehabilitate. This is critical to patient survival in this case. So first of all, immediate drug procedure, like we said before, sorry, and then make the diagnosis. The great diagnosis of MI, start ECG monitoring immediately, IV cannula immediately. You should have ongoing ECG monitoring. You put a monitor there where you are seeing it. Because you can, can have a, a reading that will stop the patient's heart. You can go and watch our talk on ACLS so that you can pick a reading that is that can kill that patient. You can see it on the screen. So pay relief, do your blood test, give aspirin 300 milligram starts unless it is contraindicated. Now, peptic ulcer is not contraindicated to aspirin when it comes to MI because the MI will kill the patient first. So give you give them, you can give them something else later, but give them, they should chew it, not swallow. 300 and then get specialist input as soon as possible. These are the number for cardio care if you need um, to transfer the patient urgently to the hospital. So, and that's what you need to do. Now, for all the patient medical management, you give pain relief, give oxygen if, 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 if the respiratory is low. Is low. Uh, so, for us, for us, somehow, or something. Oxygen, then give nitrates for, you have to get hot caveats, you talk about that. Give antiplatelets, give high dose that we typically give 80 milligrams of autobastatin or 40 of autobastatin. Anticoagulates, beta blockers, and ICU care. Please do not compromise. It doesn't matter how stable the patient is looking. I beg of you. I am kneeling down in my heart. I beg of you. Please. Then get them to a cat lab as soon as possible. Audient PCI. If you cannot get to a cat lab within two hours, then start thrombolysis with one of these agents and then get it to track cat lab thereafter. If you could not do that within 12 hours of the patient having chest pain, 6 to 12 hours, then do medical management, stabilize first, and then send the specialist send us, and then follow up, treat all the complications. So this is just a very simple way. So morphine for pain, pain. oxygen where necessary, nitrates, but don't give nitrates if it is if the X elevation is in B2, B2 3, 3, and ABF. ABF. Don't give nitrates if the patient are taking Viagra recently. So ask. In the last 48 hours, 24 hours, ask. Yes. Some people took something and they were on top of woman when it happened. And then you just did. Hey, ask so that you don't kill the patient on your table. So ask. Don't be ashamed. Send everybody out if you need to. Then aspirin plus clopidogrel typically. 300 milligrams typically of aspirin chewed, and then you could take a little grade 300. High dose statin, and then heparin or flexin for anticoagulation could be given. Okay, now there are other things A, B, C, A for so ARB, if there's no hypertension, for beta blockers, and C for CCU admission and specialist care. This is how you manage. This care will be given by everybody. Wherever you are, you can give this care, you can save that life. Wherever you are, you can save that life after you've made the diagnosis of an MR of acute coronary syndrome. So get specialist care as early as you can. MI kills. It kills. Please and please. So PU, I've given all the details here. Um, like a glycerin, it could be sublingual, uh, clopidogrel, typically 300 to 600. Um, you have nitroglycerin spray. Yes, and also do that. Yes, under the top, under the top, we just spray it there. But don't spray more than one, more than three times in one yes. hour. Don't spray more than three times in one hour. Don't give more than three times under the tongue of the tablet in one hour. Please, please, please. You could have very intractable hypertension. Then beta blockers except contraindicated and then high dose starting. So these are the doses you want to give them. Okay, so patient has come in early. We try and get to the cast lab as soon as possible. Get straight to the and luckily cardio care is here for for most of northern Nigeria, most of most of the country. We can get the patient here and we can take care of the patient as soon as we get in 
to the hospital, and the, the goal is to be able to do that possibly within one and a half hours. Okay. Not more than two hours if exactly. this is possible. So I will just um, try and show you what the uh, angel looks like. Let me see. What is what this thing looks like? What they're doing. Okay, so that is Cardio Care Hospital, and that's uh, us here. I'm just showing you what the International World Club Hospital looks like. So this is what the CAT Lab looks like. The entire team is always on standby. Um, these are different people coming in where we are showing how to do it. We just take a puncture first in the femoral artery, and then we pass the wire in and a sheet in. So a very simple procedure. Then we now get a catheter through. The patient is typically awake. Uh, we pass a catheter through the femoral artery of the ascending aorta, ascending aorta, and into the coronary vessels. Takes less than five minutes or two minutes to be there, and then we can see where the blockage is. We do on the right, and we do on the left. Sometimes we use the wrist, the radial artery, not just that. And we, for example, in this case, we can see this blockage right here. So what we do when we see a blockage that is in this patient's MI, we take a wire, like we have seen the wire, and pass it into the coronary artery. So you can see how we are passing the uh, wire in. The wire goes ahead. Then we put a balloon to open it up first. Then after the balloon, the next thing, a blow blow. <laughs> the next thing, we put a stent. The stent now keeps the place open and blood vessel and blood can now go and the blockage is gone. So this is what we do routinely every day. I'm sure doesn't have to go abroad. This is where we used to inflate the balloon of the stent. It's not just a syringe. It's a special device that we measure the pressure that we are putting in. So when we are doing it, you can see that blockage that was there before. You can see us inflating the balloon there. And then after we have done all of that and put it, um, you can see that place that was blocked now is completely opened up. Chest pain will disappear. Patient is fine. And then patient can move. Sometimes we have to give drugs directly into the coronary vessel. Drugs like adenosine, drugs like nitroglycerin, but that is very high specialist um, care. Okay, so that's what happened. It's typically a very, very um, simple procedure, and it takes about 30 to 60 minutes, and um, you know, appropriate thing. So that patient we talked about, he had the coronary angio, um, 85 to 90 percent uh, was found. Um, he had stents deployed to the different areas. And this was ECG at presentation, and this was the ECG afterward. I hope you can see the difference. This is the ECG at presentation, and this is the ECG afterwards. Now, you can see the ECG afterwards. Very, very markedly different. The SA has come down. And I think when we do the patient can go next day or two days after. We also try and rehabilitate. But the patient must be on case on those things for life. This is another patient. Also, like this is the one I was talking about. Go ahead, sir. So, for like Christmas Eve, been getting treatment for ulcer, but the pain, the character just changed that day and didn't respond to any of the medication. And by the time he came in, the troponin was almost like times 10, the upper limit wow. of normal. Wow. And the ST segment elevation was from V1 to almost wow. V6. Wow. And by the time he went to cat lab, he had a 100% of occlusion of the mid left anterior descending. So yeah. had cut clot extraction, then um, I, the I, stent was put. I, I will try and show you uh, a, a video of the, of the, um, of the case. That's I'll try and show you a video of the case so that we can appreciate um, what has been done. And what can be done here in Nigeria? What can be done here in Nigeria and here in Abuja in Cardio Care? So uh, let me see how do I do this. Uh, OK, so I think we can see that. And then so patient came in. This is the same way we do the angio. It goes all the way up. And then we are able to see uh, what is there. 100% occlusion. This is where the coronary artery should have been. You can see the line. That's where it most have been. But there is no coronary artery showing there. The left anterior descending is a total occlusion. 
That wire is here, we pass it, and then we can now pass the wire and um, so let me let me just go back a little. Let me slow down this video a little bit. So this is this was where the artery was supposed to have to have been. I hope, I hope we can see that this artery ought to have come from here. Let me. I know it's not mm -hmm. So let me do it carefully and then show you. So this action here ought to have come continuous like, like this, that. like this. But we can see that it stopped completely here. Because of the 100% of So 100% occlusion. That was what happened in this young man. And this is how the act is supposed to have been coming across all this way. And then we have a 100% occlusion. Luckily, the patient was able to get to the cat lab within one hour of coming here. And then, and then that's what we are now had to do. So let me um, go on to show you what happened next. So that is how it would have been. Um, so we'll continue. So next, we pass that wire, like I said. This was a what we call a BMW. BMW is not like the car. It's a balanced middle weight wire that allows us to cross the blockage and pass all the way in that place. And you can see this small black spot here. That's the bloom bloom, a 2.5 mm balloon that we're inflating there to try and review and deflate, inflate and deflate to try and increase the blood supply. Now, after doing that, we can see that there's some blood flow. You can see some black now. The blood flow is showing, but it's not very, it's not very good because there are lots of blood clots here in this uh, young man's uh, ECG. So what do we do next? If you look carefully at this one, we have a special catheter called a clot and export advance it's a special kind of catheter, aspiration catheter. We pass it inside the coronary artery and we suck out the clots. And then we suck out the clots from there. So that is what we call, um, that is the, so we pass this small catheter here and then we suck out the clots. So that's how we, we went ahead, sucked out the clot. And I will show you the blood clot that we sucked out. See the, see the catheter coming out, coming out. And then so, can you see the clots? That was aspirated from inside. This is very magnified, of course. It's not as big as this. It was magnified very significantly. So you can now see the clot that was brought out. So, but how we did that, after bringing this out, happily, happily, um, very, uh, you know, by the time we did that now, we can now repeat it. Can we now see the, the actually coming out very well? The actually is much better. We can see it showing all the way. But it's still very tiny. It is not the very best. So the next thing we do is to now put our stents to remove to across the area of the blockage. That's the good small iron mesh thingy. And we put our stents. We are taking you through an advanced procedure. You are right here in Cardio K over the internet. And then after that, you can see the place that was blocked. There's some blood supply. But the blood supply is not still going very well. See very tiny blood flow. It should be bigger than this. So what do we do next? We take another balloon and try and optimize the stent. Then we give through the coronary vessels right inside. We give nitroglycerin and we give adenosine. So this is a very powerful drug. One of the side effects of adenosine when we give with intra coronary is it can cause a heart block. The patient can just go asystole. So we are we are aware of that and we are ready to deal with it. And the way we also give the um, the adenosine also allows allows it to reduce the risk of that. So we gave this for this young man, and you can see the, the blood flow now. It isn't that lovely. The thing that stopped here 100% here, we can see it going all the way down for, for this man. Chest pain resolved. In fact, by this time, the man has, was now sleeping on the table from shouting about his chest pain. So um, this is something that can be done here. I can thank you very much. I can see some hand claps and um, emojis. Thank you. And luckily, uh, we also got um, a national award of excellence from the Nigerian Cardiac Society. And um, this is a national center of excellence for cardiovascular care. We've done over 600 plus successful procedures, not just uh, angels for this kind of, like we're talking about chest pain, 
but pacemakers, ICDs, ICD, ICD, recognition therapy, IDC filters, CDT, or CDT for pulmonary embolism, all kinds of that. And that is what we have been doing right here in Abuja. I would love to share with you and to uh, see whether we can uh, benefit from our experience, our experience here in this in this regard. Okay, so um, with this, we'll take questions. I think we are more or less uh, stopped. We'll take we'll take questions as we uh, try and sort it out. Uh, with that. I don't know if there are any questions. We can put them in the chat box. We'll answer them uh, beautiful. Okay, you can put them in the Q and A box. So somebody asked, can all MI patients get microglycerin, Doctor? Um, we, we talked about patients where you don't want to give nitrates. We talked about patients that has low blood pressure. So your MI patient is rushed in and the blood pressure is less than 90, 60. Yeah. Please do not give them any form of nitrates, whether uh, under the tongue, whether so spray. Patients with low blood pressure, patients that has inferior myocardial infarction. Because that affects the right ventricle, they will most likely have right ventricular failure with low blood pressure. So you don't want anything that will further worsen that. Then we talk about people that are taking uh, Viagra, yeah. Viagra field in the last yeah. 24 to 48 hours. You don't want to give them nitrate. So you have to be careful. You have to make sure that you ask about this. You check your vital sign and make sure that all these factors are not there before we give the patients the medication. So it is not every patient with myocardial infarction that can take nitroglycerin. Okay, so um, I think that's very clear for all of us. Somebody's asking about pediatric patients. Uh, while I was a chin so he's asking about pediatric patients, and uh, that's like a consultant. Well, for pediatrics, um, MI is very, very rare in pediatrics, and most of the chest pain is more likely due to pericarditis and infective um, conditions. You still have to do an ECG in children, but it's not as mandatory as it is in an adult. We've had some cases where we had very young children having uh, some of this, typically due to coronary ectasias. That is, um, yes, congenital um, issues that surrounded their, that surrounded their, um, you know, their coronary arteries. So there are some, that's something you should know. So for children, you need specialist care. There is no shortcut. We cannot just be thinking about vasodilators or all of that. Um, and about cost and technicalities, honestly, I don't know how, how we can assist. So but the pediatric cardiologist, the pediatric cardiologist, you need to call me. So we have a pediatric cardiologist to our staff um, in a children's hospital and we take care of those cases. It's about titrating all the different things and then making a clear-cut diagnosis and be sure about what is wrong with the with the uh, guests. So um, so what other question is there? Please highlight the role of aspirin in primary prevention. Is aspirin not recommended for me? Is aspirin not recommended? If aspirin is not recommended, what medication can be used for primary prevention? So it depends on your chart on your ASCVD score. If you are on this call, if you already have Medscape, MedCal, MD Cal on your computer and your phone. Um, where you should be able to um, check and check what the um, score is. If the patient does not have a significant risk uh, for MI or for cardiovascular disease, there is no need for aspirin. There is no need for aspirin. So the aspirin is reserved for those that, we, that have a significant risk. They have diabetes, they have a significant risk for um, for, for atherosclerotic and the vascular disease. So those are the ones that we give. So it's not necessarily all patients. So you should be careful also giving patients that don't have very high risk and patients that are both 65 because you yes. end up with yes. bleeding and all of that. And that can be very uh, significant. Okay. And in the context of our discussion of today, for patients coming in actively with this pain, you need to give them that 300 milligram. Yeah. And after intervention, especially for those that we have said, they need to be on 75 milligrams of aspirin. Do articulate. Here we use aspirin and for at least six to nine months. Six 
to nine months as the case may so be. if you have seen a patient maybe we have sent your, your patient i will send back to you please don't say that i will make a mistake by giving both aspirin and clopidogrel we did not make a mistake the patient needs to be on those two drugs to prevent clots uh to prevent clots um, uh clots in that stance they have to be on it for six to nine months now if they have to do a surgery or something please call us so that we can give advice in that we regard stop how, to, how to stop what to do they have to do a surgery because it's typically not good to do surgery while you're computer grill or and then you can take, take it off so we'll give advice in that regard but typically they need to be on dual antiplatelet for at least six to nine months if they had a stent in and they typically need to be on either one of them for life. Them for life. But typically, torpedo grab preferred has to be on it for life. So that is uh, typically uh, um, okay. So let me see. Um, can I so by the nitrate be used if the person is not available? E yes, but I saw that nitrate is typically oral and not long -acting. and long acting. So it does not give the effect immediately. So when you give it, it will slowly. Just take time and stock your clinic. These drugs are available in this country. So take time. But if you don't have nitroglycerin, you can use a sulfur nitrate. It's a little long acting. So when you give it, it will take some time to work and have a good effect um, in that regard. Please, does cardio care have drug electric stent or bare metal stent? So generally, in modern practice, almost there are indications for bare metal stent. They are very few. So virtually all our stents, 99.9% .9 of our stents are drug reducing stents. We have loads of stents in our cat lab, different sizes, shapes, for the leg, for the hand, for different kind of things, so that any kind of patient that comes uh, with whatever problem, we can uh, sort it out. Um, so shed some light on vasospastic angina. Shed some light on vasospastic angina. Yeah, please. Is better in China. Yes. So what we have here is uh, there is spasm or let, let me use the word contraction of the coronary artery. This is common in young people. Yeah. In young people who present with typical chest pain. Yeah. But you go in, you don't find any atherosclerotic changes. So that is why we say it is not only atherosclerotic sclerotic occlusion that can cause MI. So you can have some spasm of the coronary artery giving rise to that uh, cessation of blood flow. So it happens and patient gets better, you do your angio, the blood and the coronary vessels are clean. So these patients, like I said, they are typically young, then the history of illicit drug use yeah. and you will typically need to give them so calcium channel blocker to relax the coronary so, blood, blood vessels. Vasospasm is typically vasospasm, and typically we don't put a stent. We just give drugs and treat it. Somebody says, could elderly patients with acute MI have these PCI procedures? Uh, that's Dr. Akin, family physician. Yes, yes. In fact, that's whether they are 90, whether they are 100, whether they are 105, we can do it. And you know, it is, it is just the arterial puncture that we are doing. And the patient is awake. It's not like a given anesthesia. So it is extremely safe even for those ages. Yes, there might be some slightly added risk, but the risk is still less than 2% risk of uh, complications. So this is quite important. So what is it in rural and resource poor settings? What are the first aid for MI? There is no different treatment for people that are poor and people that are rich. The same treatment in rural, areas and poor settings is the same treatment in places that are well the only difference in this case may be that rural and people will not have access to a cath lab or to have stents so and they will not have access to the beta clot busters so they may have to use um streptokinase but still they will still have to spend some money they will still have to get aspirin clopidogrel, grail statins nitrates bisoprolol all of those things still cost money and those things are, are life saving. So they should not die. We are still engaging, even as cardio care, we're engaging with the National Health Insurance Agency and other agencies to see how insurance coverage can be, um, how insurance coverage can be um, extended to reach different parts of the country. And we hope that sooner rather than later, that will be available for um, all of us. All right. Um, 
Somebody asks, why don't you give nitrates to people with inferior MI? The reason is because of hypertension. The blood pressure can go down very significantly, and you may have very, you may not be able to get it back up. So it can be very, very serious. So you typically have to be careful in that case. Um, can you use a somebody who answered that? Um, can you use a drug eluting stent? Yes, we use drug eluting stent for everybody. Um, the WhatsApp group, the WhatsApp group. Um, if you look in the chat box, Pamela, if you look in the chat box, you will see a link that you can use to join the WhatsApp group so that you can ask your questions even after this, so that you can, if somebody said, will the um, CME point be shared? Yes, the recorded presentation. Go to our YouTube page, not just this presentation. Other pages are there. Other discussions are there. So this presentation will be right there on our YouTube page. The link is in the chat group. You can go to YouTube and you can see this recorded presentation and other ones that will be there. So that will be really helpful to your practice um, going forward. What is the role of Nicorandil and Vasteril in severe chest pain? Okay, fine. Nicorandil is quite useful. And we typically use Nicorandil typically after coronary intervention. Vasteril, however, is a second line agent. We typically, add yes, like add-on therapy. So Vastarel is an add-on therapy after this one. Patient is still having chest pain, despite you have maximized other care, Vastarel. Nicorandil is quite particularly useful in patients that have had intervention. You can use it in case of nitrates really, but it's particularly useful post-intervention uh, in terms of vasodilatation. But there's a good comparison. There are studies that so, compare both. Um, uh, the other notable side effects from other nitrates is less in, headache. In headache is less with the corangio. Vastarel is more like the relaxation of the coronary, Correct. coronary artery muscle so that there could still be good it's, blood flow. It, but it, they it are not, just like add on, not it's add on. In fact, Vastarel does not even affect blood flow, sir. It affects a, a, ADP or something like that. Uh, so it's just an add on and just increase pain. Somebody asks, and uh, what do we use to preload our patients for PCI? Uh, that person is a very serious person. Everybody has seen that person. It's a very, very serious person. Let me see the name. Um, I, I can't see the name very well. Okay. Uh, somebody, so, somebody said, what do we use for preloading? So for preloading, uh, we typically use, and we use heparin afterwards. Please, sir, what's the best position for MI patients on referral to the higher center? The position that is comfortable for the patient, but typically we live in cardiac position. Um, so, what's the question again? Preload. So, typically we do 600 milligrams of clopidogrel and 300 milligrams of aspirin. If all, we use 180 milligrams of ticagrelor and 300 milligrams of aspirin. Whether I use ticagrelor or, um, or clopidogrel, that's what's available in Nigeria currently, readily available. Ticagrelor has a relatively faster onset of action. So if you have a, an active patient like that and you are trying to do, you know, try to see what it is, that's what we do. Um, we just go to the um, Chicago get a faster action, and then you go in. Then, of course, when you want to put a stent, before you take any value on any coronary arteries, we typically must reparinize the patient. Then we measure what we call the activated clotting time, ACT. Throughout the procedure, we measure it. And after the procedure, we have to measure the activated clotting time before you move your sheet. That the patient does not bleed. All of those things we follow them according to international guidelines, and we've had very fantastic successes uh, results by doing what is the international um, standard. Okay, for unstable angina, how do you manage? You manage medically. You manage medically on the world. All of medical therapy, monas, you follow it's everything. The same for everything. Everything. So Where you have the difference is in that initial acute management. Yeah. But the other treatments is the same. Uh, nitrates, beta blockers, statin, antiplatelets, uh, ARB, ACB, inhibitor, as indicated, and the treatment of other cardiovascular risk factors. Somebody said, um, I managed a patient with BP 14090 uh, four days before it was 18100. Chest was normal. ECD showed antiraceptal segments. Elevation patient has no chest pain whatsoever. Again, just like we said, patient has ST elevation, you must do troponins immediately. 
You mug it openings immediately, and then you follow our algorithm. You follow our algorithm. No chest pain, S elevation, do the troponin. If the protein is high and there's no ongoing chest pain, is this new or old? It could be a silent MI that is happening. Remember that, that a significant to 20 10 percent of patients do not have chest pain just by having MI. So that time they came, you say four days ago, it came with 1800 and now it's 14090. That 1800, that time they came, likely they had the MI. So they came to a silent MI and you need to manage accordingly. Get the patient to a cat lab, get the patient to a specialist as soon as possible. Even now, that you have you have seen this presentation, get the patient to a specialist as soon as possible so that he can he can plan. So in MI, we give 300 milligrams of aspirin and 300 milligrams of topidogrel. Yes, typically, typically 300 aspirin, 300 of but be sure of the diagnosis before you do that. And then thereafter, we now continue at 75. Okay, review to medication 65 year old, hypertension, obese, uh, all one daily. I don't understand the question. What are the contraindications and complications that can arise from this procedure? Yes, there are contraindications and there are complications. Complications can be many. However, complications are typically less than 0 0.5, less than, less than 0 1%. So 99% of cases worldwide, including cardio care, uh, do not have any significant complication. But they could bleed from their side. All the aspirin we are giving, the pudogrel, they could bleed, heparin we are giving, they could, they could have arrhythmia. Sometimes when you open the blood flow back to the plate that was blocked. If they could have what we call repetition injury. That blood that comes suddenly, that place gets excited and it starts giving abnormal rhythms. So, um, um, that abnormal rhythms, then you also agree by clicking. Uh, um, Pamela, I think you added it in inside Q&A instead of chat group. Where's Pamela? Please put it in the chat group, not in Q&A. They might not see the Q&A. Um, so, uh, so, those are these. Now, some contraindication. If the patient is coming too late after the chest pain and the patient is stable, we typically will not go in. If the patient has very significant renal dysfunction, we have to be careful. But remember, this is a life saving condition. So, every case is taken um, yes. differently, case by case basis. If the patient declines to give consent, it's a contraindication. They say that they are afraid, they don't want to do, they want to pray, we allow them to pray. And we too will pray with them. Okay? Um, so somebody says it's typically not better than torpedo grill. Um, it is theoretically better than torpedo grill, but it has a side effect of dyspnea in some patients. But it has better um, antiplatelet activity and it has faster activity from time of taking it. So yes, but it's available. But it's available. So yes, I think that's better. Yes, I think better. You see, but, that also, but we should also know that the risk of. Uh, Bleeding or other complications from them is also higher than the Okay, so if you want to refer to cardio care, 0908 7777 uh, is the number that you use. I'm very grateful. We had over 260, 270 participants from all over the country. We are very grateful to all of you. I'm sure you had value for your time. We will send the link across, but if you look in your chat box now, you will see the YouTube link to our channel so that on our YouTube, please click subscribe, follow, you know, so that you can um, look at all our, and when we post it, you will get the notification. Also click the notification icon so that you will know whenever we post a new video there. So I can watch and benefit in case you even miss the group. And you want to watch it again, go back to the YouTube channel. Okay, there. Yeah. There's also a link in the chat box to join the WhatsApp group so that you can discuss cases you can put your, your ECGs if you need assistance. Um, but remember, it's not an emergency group. So um, so that is the case. So we are here in Abuja um, by the grace of God. I want to thank all of those, including our learned colleagues. Uh, the link is here in the chat, but just scroll up in the chat, in the chat group, group and you will see the link for that. Or if you can't find that, go to Cardio Care dot ng slash webinars go to our website cardiocare.ng you also find the links um there the recorded presentation and your cmp points will be um sent to your mail i want to thank dr alecon especially for the fantastic and um you know presentation i want to thank pamela i want to thank everybody i want to thank all of you for joining up uh, we are truly 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 grateful um and then if there's any burning question, we will just uh, take it. Um, but however, 
Thank you all from Kadokia to the world, from Abuja to the world. So please um, uh, do good by uh, referring guests that need it. That must need not only this, that if patient has diabetes and diabetic foods, let's try and save that lane. Patient is a pacemaker, patient is a device. And occasionally we do have um, some charity that we are that is available from donors and from the hospital. We give about 10% of all our procedures as charity. So occasionally we can help in one way or the other when um, issues arise. So with this, without much ado, we will close um, this. Um, we'll back next month. Yes, we'll, so next month, by God's grace, um, we will be back. If, if people that want to join the cardio care group, please look in that chat chat box there. You will see the um, the link to join the WhatsApp group. Okay, you will see the link to join the WhatsApp. We we'll also send the link to your email where we are sending the um, where we are sending the slides. We will send the link to join the WhatsApp group so that you can also contribute and you will get notification of our next webinar. The before cardio care next webinar, our children are going to have a webinar on meningitis in children. Fantastic webinar coming up. Our pediatric neurologist is being pressed up, ready to move stuff in that regard. Um, please go through the, the link. It's there. The link is there. Just go up, 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 up in the chat box. You'll see the link. Otherwise, just wait for the mail. You'll get the mail. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. God bless you. And uh, we wish everyone good health and fantastic uh, uh, weekend. If you're in Abuja, please join us tomorrow for Abuja Health Walk. We'll be walking from Limi Hospital Central Area at 7 a.m. We're also be teaching CPR. So if you're in Abuja, join us. Let us practice what we preach. Join us tomorrow. All right, bye.